Over a century ago, railroad baron William McKenzie built the house of his dreams in Kirkfield, a quaint town in rural Ontario. This house is now a beautiful country inn. A desk clerk was starting his first shift at the McKenzie Inn. He had no idea this was to be a night like no other. Since construction began in 1888, Kirkfield, Ontario, Sir William Mackenzie Inn has been many things, from a private home to a school, even a convent, and now a bed and breakfast. This building has touched the lives of so many people, some of whom have chosen to stay on long after death. A guest at the inn was leaving for the evening when she heard the sound of piano music drifting through the downstairs rooms. She followed the sound into the billiard parlor and heard the clack of pool balls in this otherwise empty room. Once again, she was startled to hear the sound of music. This time, Seeing a ghostly young girl seated at the piano, the child looked at her and quickly darted away. She was angry at the woman for interrupting her playing. Number of reports of uh of seeing a little girl, the previous owners to us in the restaurant um, reportedly seeing a, a young girl hidden with sort of shabby knees, uh, dirty knees hidden underneath one of the counters there on a couple of occasions. Uh, in one of the uh, closets up on the third floor where the domestic servants used to be during Mackenzie's time, and there's a very large lead-lined cistern up there that holds a whole lot of water. And, uh, a couple of different mediums had these impressions that a, a young girl might have been um, abused or, or uh, drowned there, or perhaps even her body was put there after uh, some foul play had come to her. And some people have uh, said that they've seen a, a ghostly nun walking back and forth between the, uh, the main residence, the inn, and the, uh, and the gatehouse. And of course, it was the sisters uh, in the early 30s that put the uh, extension on the gatehouse and built it into uh, a two-floor building with, um, with the classrooms up there. And there's actually old original signatures uh, on the walls up there of the tradespeople that built it. So there certainly can be a presence there, perhaps. A noted psychic was staying at the Mackenzie Inn. She was awakened with a sensation of the entire room rocking, as if shaken by giant hands. An unseen force began pulling at her bedsheets terrifying her.
without a moment's hesitation, she ran from the room. The next day, she decided not to leave the inn. Rather, she chose to hold a seance, assisted by one of the staff who had also experienced unexplainable events at the inn. As the seance progressed, she began to make contact with spirits. The first was an entity who identified herself as Sister Mary. The psychic asked her to move on in peace, but Sister Mary refused, claiming there was work to be done and she would not leave until it was completed. As the seance continued, the psychic made contact with a second presence who identified herself as Nellie. Nellie was apparently a housekeeper at the inn during the 1800s, who stayed on because she loved the house so much. The psychic was exhausted and the seance came to a close. The psychic detected that Sister Mary was there protecting the little girl seen by so many. Feeling she had failed to protect her in life, she was compelled to do so in death. That night, the psychic was awakened by a blinding blue light. She didn't know what to make of it until she looked over and saw the figure of Nellie knitting peacefully. Amazingly, the psychic remained calm and felt an overwhelming sense of warmth and joy emanating from Nellie. Nellie vanished and the room returned to normal. But those feelings remained with the psychic ever since. Feelings reported by many fortunate guests at the Sir William Mackenzie Inn. The present owners and many of the guests can't deny that they are not alone, a simple fact that they have chosen to accept, and the spirits who linger at the Mackenzie Inn have made sure that those who check in as rigid skeptics always check out as true believers. On a normal day of operation, the Cumberland Heritage Museum received some artifacts. The items were to be placed on display in the portion of the museum called the Duford House. it would seem that two of these items were ultimately not meant to be part of the exhibit. Often when someone holds an object dear to their heart in life, they take this connection with them beyond the grave. This phenomenon is very visible at the Heritage Museum in Cumberland, Ontario. In the museum's Duford House, there is a spirit who remains possessive of two of the house's wonderful artifacts. Museums acquire artifacts from many different places. Although many practical things can be learned from them, 
the authentic history of some of these artifacts remains a mystery. One may speculate that the little girl who once owned these dolls in her life still shares a connection with them in her death. Here at the Cumberland Heritage Museum, a lot of people feel that the Duford house is inhabited by spirits. Other fellow employees have experienced cold chills and footsteps being heard around upstairs, as well as the dolls being moved around for them as well. Now, a lot of people believe that it is the spirit of the little girl who is playing with the dolls that is moving them around. Now, my particular experience here at the Duford House was an unnerving one. I walked in at the beginning of my shift to straighten up things before tour arrived, and I found the two dolls lying on the floor here in the living room. And I know, I'm almost certain that nobody else was in the house before me, so I picked them up and I brought them back upstairs. As I was straightening out the bedroom, a fellow employee of mine had come into the house and he had given them to me when I had just put them down on the chair behind me. Needless to say, this disturbed me a little bit. So we placed them, I placed them back onto the chair and I went back down the stairs to straighten up the dining room. When I realized again that the dolls were there in the dining room on the buffet. And that was when I left the building. The Duford House is a recreation of life in the early 1900s. Everything in the museum is authentic turn of the century fare, including the little girl who continues to play with her beloved dolls. One Halloween night, a radio station decided to stage a publicity stunt. 
The stunt was in keeping with the holiday theme. A member of the staff volunteered to spend the night in the allegedly haunted Firkin's house. He was a skeptic and was sure that nothing would happen. But as it turned out, he was wrong. He took a quick tour of the house and decided to settle in, waiting to see if, in fact, any strange events were going to take place. On the table next to where he was sitting was a book on magic. As he picked it up and started to read, he felt as if he was no longer alone. He began to hear the sound of footsteps echoing through the house. Glimpsing the mysterious figure for a second time, he decided the radio station stunt was concluded. The Firkins House sits in Alberta's Fort Edmonton Park, a place where original buildings have been moved and restored. But sometimes when you move buildings, certain things have a way of coming with them. Fort Edmonton Park is Canada's largest living history museum. We depict four eras in time from 1846 at a Hudson's Bay Fort and then on the streets of 1885, 1905 and 1920. We have historical interpreters in each of the buildings and they bring the park to life. So when you actually come into the park, you ride the train to the fort and then you experience each era and you have hands-on experiences and live life just as it would have been during those time periods. The Firkins House is now a museum at Fort Edmonton Park. But prior to this, it had been a private home. When the previous owners bought the house, it included the entire estate and some unique personal possessions. The oddest being a ventriloquist dummy owned by a boy that had died there. This dummy seemed to have a will of its own, appearing in the strangest places. Much of the paranormal activity in the house occurs in the bedroom where the boy died. The dummy, among other items, had been kept in the house in memory of this unfortunate boy. The boy had fallen ill and was confined to his room. He spent his final days practicing magic and ventriloquism. Throughout the young boy's illness, his loving mother never left his side. Eventually, the boy succumbed to his illness and he died with his mother at his side. Their spirits linger on in the house today. Another terrifying incident took place when the owner decided to redecorate the boy's room. As she climbed the stairs, she came face to face with a pale figure blocking her passage. Slowly, she made her way up to investigate.
At first, the room seemed empty. Feeling that she was in physical danger from the spirit, the terrified woman chose to donate the house to Fort Edmonton Park. To this day, paranormal researchers flock to study the Firkins house. I came here to the Firkins house at night to take some photographs. I felt a continuous sense of my every move being watched by someone. I took photos in the two bedrooms, and it definitely felt as if I was unwanted. Downstairs, I felt I was being watched, but not in general. More like someone was actually in the room with me. Outside I took some shots, and there was this certain area on one side of the house that was much colder than even the air around it. And when I took a photograph of the window from the woman's bedroom, the light was on, and the curtain seemed to be pulled back. When I got the film developed, I was surprised by it. There were these strange balls of light in some of the rooms. It was though the film somehow managed to capture the image of the spirits in this house. I will never forget the feeling of being watched from that upstairs window. Even though the Firkins house has been uprooted from its original foundation, the spirits still feel it is their home. Consider this, the next time you're moving a house, you may be moving more than just plaster and nails. There is an abandoned railway tunnel in Niagara Falls which has a special significance. It is the birthplace of an infamous urban legend. For decades, people have hiked through the woods to catch a glimpse of the ghosts in what locals have christened the Screaming Tunnel. One young woman brought her visiting friend. She shared the sad tale of the little girl who had been killed inside and whose tragic story became the basis for this ghostly legend. Like many local young people, she had already challenged the ghost of the tunnel, proving her courage to her friends. She then prompted her friend to do the same and share in this Niagara Falls rite of passage. The two women waited for nightfall. At midnight, they returned. The local explained to her friend that for everything to work, she would have to stand in the tunnel and light a wooden match, but she had to do it alone. Not knowing what to expect, her fear began to mount. She fumbled with the matches. Her heart was pounding. raced in, only to find her shaking in terror. The visitor had learned firsthand why this place had earned the name, the Screaming Tunnel. In Niagara Falls, Ontario, a local legend has become a rite of passage for the city's youth. For generations, they have tested their courage against the spirit of a murdered young girl. Now, no passage into adulthood is complete without a trip through the Screaming Tunnel. A tunnel has lots of mystery and legend. The tunnel itself was built just before the outbreak of World War I. 
uh, when funds fell through and they were having financial difficulties, um, all plans had to be scrapped, including the tunnel here. It was just left unused. There is the infamous legend here of the girl who um, brutally died in the tunnel. According to legend, the little girl had been forced to flee from her psychopathic father. He had just lost a bitter custody battle and in a fit of rage had burnt down their house. Get back here! Narrowly escaping the fire, the little girl tried desperately to get away. Where did you go? She ran as fast as she could through the woods near her home, but every time she stopped for breath, she could hear her father coming up behind her. He was closing in quickly. Searching for a place to hide, she came upon the abandoned tunnel. In terror, she ran into the darkness, hoping the shadows would conceal her. But there was no hiding from her deranged father. He followed her into the tunnel. He then doused her with gasoline. and in one horrible final moment, burned her alive. Since then, paranormal investigators have recorded strange sounds echoing through the tunnel. Mostly eerie screams. Some of the investigators also claim to have made physical contact with more than one spirit. them to believe that the terrified little girl may not be the only ghost who haunts the screaming tunnel. They say that at midnight you can come here to the tunnel, stand right in the center of it, bring matches. They say that they have to be wooden matches, you can't use a lighter. And when you strike the match, you hold it up and you're supposed to hear a scream immediately followed by the match burning out. The same local resident and her friend bravely returned to see if they could repeat their earlier experience. Again, they heard the frightening scream. But this time, when they turned towards the entrance, they saw a transparent figure approaching them. It is believed that the little girl's father is one of the other ghosts in the tunnel. Though he disappeared after the murder, perhaps he remains there to relive that fateful day. Or maybe he is looking for more victims. Local legend says that if he actually reaches someone inside, they will die instantly. Not wishing to test the myth, the two girls fled. But many others come every day brave souls willing to challenge the spirits of the screaming tunnel. The Mathers House in Burnaby, British Columbia is now the site for the Burnaby Potters Guild. This historic house was once home to a religious group. The Canadian Temple of the More Abundant Life used this facility as a place of worship and as a school for their children. However, the leader of this group, Archbishop John I, left behind more than just an unusual bit of history. The Mathers House behind me uh, has an interesting history. It was built in 1912 for the family of William and Mary Hart. In 1935, uh, William Hart died, and within four years, this house was sold to the Canadian Temple of the Universal Foundation of More Abundant Life. 
They set up residences for their students at the elementary and the high school levels. The temple was here for almost a decade, and it was at the end of that decade that they were found to be a cult, and they were run out of town by the province, the police, the municipality. The leader of the cult called himself Archbishop John I, although his real name was Tom Wosley, the very same Tom Wosley who was wanted in the United States on charges of bigamy and spousal abuse. What is this title? It's another one! Even more disturbing were the allegations of child abuse. Who left these toys in the grass? John I was no saint and had a terrible temper, often venting his rage on his students. It was not uncommon for the archbishop to chastise his kids regularly. Though the specific punishments varied, they were always harsh and cruel. I'm sick and tired of having to remind you where the toys should be, and not in the grass. At times, he would lock children in closets for hours, and there was also speculation of physical abuse. Now you sit down too. Often, he would single one child out. Then, he would yell and scream insults at the top of his lungs in order to humiliate each child in front of their peers. Are you whispering behind my back? How many more times do I have to tell you we don't do things like that? Other than leaving a very dark mark on this house and the people who lived here under his severe discipline, Tom Wosley has disappeared from history after having been run out of town. However, children who had become victim to his humiliating acts still seem unable to sever their terrifying bonds with this place. We're not going to have any more of this, are we? Are we? There were many allegations of Archbishop John I manifesting his temper against the children who were the residences in, residents in these houses, um, where for my, even minor, misdemeanors, the children were locked up in closets for many hours at a time without any contact. Um, this may explain some of the phenomenon here. On one occasion, a maintenance man came to work. Upon entering the building, he found a misplaced toy. As he continued down the hallway, he found another. Finding these items strewn about seemed peculiar to him. Since there were no children around, inside another room, the maintenance man heard a rustling sound coming from the closet. Suddenly, the toy he was holding was snatched out of one hand, and then the other. The man stood there dumbfounded when he heard the rustling again. The noise grew louder. The man slowly and carefully walked towards the closet and peeked inside. He saw the figure of a young boy. The young spirit was obviously disturbed by the maintenance man's presence and made it abundantly clear he did not want him there. On an overnight project, an artist stayed late to finish a few pieces. As she glazed her pot, she heard thumping coming from behind the door. But when she stopped to listen, she couldn't hear it anymore. The thumping started again. This time, she slowly walked over to the door to listen more closely. But the noise stopped a second time. She was startled when one of the ceramic pieces crashed down to the floor. And then another. The woman saw the young, ghostly figure destroying her work. She turned and struggled with the door, 
Someone or something was preventing her from escaping that room. Finally, the door came loose and she ran from the room. This was by far the most terrifying experience of her life. The Mathers House seems to be home to many tormented children, perhaps those who had been abused and victimized in the Archbishop's so-called religious cult have returned to relive their childhoods without persecution, but this time exercising their vengeance on anyone who enters the building. The Mar residence in Saskatoon is a museum and meeting center, but after hours, it takes on a life of its own as home to an array of spirits. A staff member had stayed late finishing notes after a board meeting. She heard footsteps echoing through the empty house. The sounds seemed to be coming closer and closer. She was shocked when a man stepped into the doorway. He was pulling on a pair of white gloves. His body was transparent and he began to almost vibrate, as if being electrocuted. She knew this was not an actual human being, but some sort of apparition. Then the strange man walked away. Frightened but curious, she followed. Entering the downstairs parlor, she found herself surrounded by floating orbs of light. These luminescent balls seemed to dance around the room, accompanied by the sound of children's laughter. The mysterious lights fascinated her, and for a moment, she forgot her fears. until she turned and saw the man from upstairs outside the window. His expressionless stare sent a shiver up her spine. And as her terror intensified, she ran away in fear. Saskatoon's Mar residence is one of the most unique and historically important houses in Saskatchewan. It is also haunted. Ironically, this very small home houses three distinct and separate ghostly entities. Um, the Mar is the oldest house in Saskatoon that's still on its original site. It was built in 1884 and the city acquired it in 1979 and it became a designated heritage property and is now open to the public for programming. There was a group of school children that came through the building one summer and one of their chaperones was a woman who um, was psychic and she was very intrigued by the, uh, the possibility of ghosts and actually came back later and walked through the house with us and described um, the, the various presences including the fellow in the upstairs bedroom. She said he was a fairly reclusive sort, spent a lot of time in his room reading. Um, he worked at a at a business that required him to do record keeping and he was very proud of his penmanship and he was very vain about his hands and he always wore gloves on his hands whenever he went outside. The antique desk that was once in the upstairs bedroom is now displayed in the parlor. This may explain why the ghost has begun to appear downstairs. For a quiet, educated man, this writing table was most likely where he felt at home. Following a function, another staff member heard sounds coming from the parlor. She saw a young man sitting at the desk. When he saw her watching him, 
he immediately stopped what he was doing, picked up his white gloves, and walked off into the corner of the room, out of her sight. She went over to investigate, but found the room was empty. But the most startling part of the encounter was the desk itself. The woman watched in amazement as all the items began to disappear one by one. And then the writing table closed up on its own. The room had returned to normal, but she couldn't shake the feeling that there was still something there with her. Um, when you look through the Henderson directories for the years 1909, 1910, there's a fellow named Charles Gathercole who lives at this address. And Charles Gathercole works as a clerk in a business on Broadway, two blocks east. So we think that perhaps the ghost of Miss Charles Gathercole, and we refer to him as Charles. The ghost downstairs um, is, a, is a very unsavory sort of character. And both the, uh, the woman who worked in the office upstairs and I felt uncomfortable in the basement. She said she could only be down there for about 10 minutes at a time before she felt somebody watching her. And he's big and burly and dirty and bearded and he's got yellow teeth and yellow fingernails and he smells. And he's just a very unsavory character. And he also has expectations of women and that they should know their place. Many of the staff have had unnerving encounters with the spirit in the basement. A woman went downstairs to locate some stored files. Immediately, she felt uncomfortable, as if something was not only watching her, but inexplicably, she felt quite threatened too. Something began to pull at her purse. Some invisible, malevolent force was trying to take it from her. She held on tightly to the bag, and for a moment, her unseen attacker relented. Then, an imperceptible energy pushed her against the wall, almost knocking her to the floor. Terrified, she ran upstairs and has never returned. No one knows who this malicious spirit could be, or why he seems to have such a disdain for women. The third paranormal being at the Mar residence is in sharp contrast to the dark, evil entity in the basement. Passers-by often report mysterious flickering lights in the windows. This phenomenon is known as sprites or pixie lights. Employees have witnessed these lights on several occasions. They report seeing small glowing orbs that float through the rooms in an almost playful fashion. Some staff members were convinced that if you stared directly into the orbs, you could catch quick glimpses of children and hear the sounds of their laughter. These mysterious lights, also known as dead man's candles, are most often seen in cemeteries. Native Indian legends suggest they were there to guide the recently deceased through limbo and onto the other side. Perhaps before the Saskatoon area was settled by Europeans, indigenous people used this spot as a burial ground. The ghosts of the historic Mar residents are truly a unique combination. Trapped in this small space are childlike balls of light, a quiet, solitary man, and an embittered brute that dwells in the basement. Why such a diverse group of spirits have chosen to share this home remains a mystery. Perhaps the floating orbs are really mystic guides trying to lead the other two souls beyond the confines of Earth and into the freedom of the afterlife. Walter Peck, a staff member at Edmonton's Mackay School Museum, was working late preparing a room for an important meeting the next morning. Satisfied with his work, Peck locked up the meeting room and began to leave.
As he walked down the hall, he heard the sounds of children echoing through the empty building. The sounds grew louder and closer until it seemed to surround him. Frightened, Peck ran from the building. Outside, Peck felt a bit embarrassed, knowing there had to be a rational explanation for what he had just experienced. Peck glanced back at the building. Standing at the window of the meeting room was a man staring down at him. Convinced it was a burglar, he raced back into the building. He found the only door into the meeting room was still locked. Yet somehow, his carefully set up room had been reduced to a shambles. He turned and found himself face to face with the figure he had seen in the window. The man stared at him coldly, then silently turned and left. Peck ran into the hallway, but the figure had disappeared and he was alone once again. Now, genuinely unnerved, he locked up and quickly left the building. This would not be Walter Peck's last encounter with the mysterious gentleman. Edmonton, Alberta's Mackay Avenue School Museum chronicles the long history of both the city and the building. But this is a museum where the past literally comes to life. The staff and visitors report an astonishing array of unexplained activity. None doubt that they share these halls with the spirits of long ago. The Mackay Avenue School Building has been many different things. It was once the site of Alberta's first legislature and now houses a museum and provincial archives. But its time as a school may have left the greatest imprint on the building, as voices from that era still echo through its empty classrooms. The Mackay School goes back to the early uh, 1900s, and I believe that the history that is in this building has led to many of its current hauntings. The kids that went to the school um, and some of the workers who worked on its original construction and some, who, some of them who died obviously are remaining behind at the school, probably just to make sure that their, uh, their school stays intact. Longtime staff member Lisa Traeger, working late one night, had a mysterious encounter with one of the building's former students. She saw a child wearing an old-fashioned school uniform staring at her. The boy ran off. Traeger was convinced the boy had somehow wandered into the building, so she followed him. The boy glared at her, angry at the intrusion. Her efforts to catch the boy proved futile, as if he could predict her every move. Giving up, she returned to her work, only to find the mysterious boy standing at her desk. Her search turned into an eerie game of hide and seek, but the boy almost seemed to disappear and reappear at will. Finally, the boy vanished before her very eyes. Shaken, she returned to her desk, only to discover her computer and paperwork strewn around the room. It looked as if a tornado had struck, or an angry child. Other members of the staff have investigated the phenomena and discovered clues to at least one spirit's identity. I've been here since October 1984 and the building I work in is haunted because a lot of people have had different and unexplained experiences, including myself. 
Well, there's been many nights with the Ouija board, and uh, the very first time with the Ouija board, I made contact with a fella, and he identified himself as Peter. He was supposedly a laborer who fell off the roof during the 1912 edition. Peter identified himself uh, as dying on January 3rd, 1912, and I was born on January 3rd, 1951. And our schoolhouse opened on January 3rd. I feel maybe that's why there's a connection between Peter and myself. A lot of other fellow workers have experienced some sort of thing happening here that was strange. The strange events generally occur at night when employees are alone. The building's boiler inexplicably failed one evening, and as the lone staff member, Walter Peck felt duty-bound to investigate. His search led him to a second encounter with Peter. Peck has since moved on to a new position and declined to be interviewed about his experiences. After hours in the Mackay School is when another employee experienced unexplainable events. First, she heard the sounds of children. The door suddenly slammed shut. No matter how hard she tried, the door would not move. But the moment she released it, the door opened by itself. As she made her way out of the building, the sounds of children surrounded her. At the window stood the ever-present spirit known as Peter, the eternal night watchman of the Mackay School. Some theorize that Peter is a guardian, protecting the young spirits that inhabit the building. We may never know why these entities have chosen to stay on after death, but one thing is clear. As long as this historic building stands, its hallways will never be truly empty. The beautiful and elegant Dean House restaurant is a popular dining spot in Calgary, Alberta. But this lovely building was also the scene of a tragedy, one which has given it the reputation as Alberta's most haunted building. One night, a staff member was alone in the building, yet she clearly heard footsteps coming from the attic. The footsteps ended, replaced by the soft notes of a piano. Nervously, she made her way up the stairs to investigate. She entered the upstairs parlor, but the room was empty. Relieved, she made her way to the piano and casually hit one of the keys. The moment she did, the room began to come alive. A rocking chair began to slowly move on its own. She reached out to steady the chair, but the rocking stopped before she could touch it. Then she saw a crimson stain on the floor. She reached down to touch the puddle when it vanished. A low, whispering sound began to emanate from a mirror in the corner. Cautiously, she made her way towards it. Behind her was a woman with wild, angry eyes. She turned to protect herself, but the room was empty. Then, some invisible force began to move the rocking chair again, and she fled, knowing she had encountered the spirits of the Dean House.
Calgary Alberta's Dean House Restaurant is located in Fort Calgary, where the city's history is celebrated. But the Dean House itself has a very different past, one which may be better left forgotten. When night falls, its dark past sometimes comes to life. The Dean House was built by the last serving superintendent of the Calgary Barracks, Captain Richard Burton Dean, and uh, he moved into the house in 1906 and lived in the house until 1914. The house is currently operated by the Fort Calgary Preservation Society as a restaurant. There are stories about hearing footsteps. Um, the first week I worked at Fort Calgary, one of the uh, windows on the third floor mysteriously blew out. Philip Dawson, former manager of the restaurant, had many paranormal encounters. He was closing up after a private function when he heard footsteps coming from the stairs. A gaunt-faced man began to descend, and as he approached, the temperature of the room dropped. The man completely ignored Philip, passing him and walking out onto the enclosed patio. Stunned for a moment, Philip followed the man. But there was no sign of him on the enclosed patio. Yet there was no other exit. It was as if the gaunt-faced man had vanished. This would not be the last time the spirits of the Dean House paid Philip a call. On another occasion, he distinctly heard a phone ringing in the building's parlor. The only phone in that room is an antique, yet it was ringing, in spite of not being connected to the wall. Then the gaunt-faced man appeared again, standing in the doorway, staring at Philip, who was frozen in fear. The figure walked away, and the phone began to ring again, a call Philip chose not to accept. There was a murder, double murder, suicide in the house. So there are many people that feel that the ghosts in the house perhaps were those two people. During the lean years of the Great Depression, the building became a boarding house. A young couple and their child lived in what is now the attic. Times were hard and the struggle to get by created tension magnified by the husband's psychological problems and abusive nature. The husband's behavior became more and more erratic until finally, one night, his inner demons took control. Holding a butcher's knife, he made his way into their bedroom. He slashed his wife repeatedly and left her mutilated body on the bed. Consumed with guilt, he used the same knife to slash his own wrists. In the morning, it was their child who came upon the gruesome aftermath. She survived the experience physically, but psychologically, it destroyed her. The brutal acts committed here may have left a permanent imprint on the house. The spirits of the family may be trapped within its walls forever, each in their own personal hell. There are reports of a ghost child, an innocent and tragic figure seen hiding in and around the attic. Perhaps this is the daughter, trapped here with her parents. Philip Dawson had another strange experience. He heard noises coming from the attic and went upstairs to investigate. Upon entering the attic, he saw a child dressed in clothing from a bygone era. She saw him and did not take kindly to his presence. She raced at him only to disappear mere inches away. To this day, Philip refuses to enter the attic of the Dean House.
The ghosts of the Dean House represent a tortured family portrait. The spirit of the woman in the mirror, condemned to relive her brutal death. Her child, even though she lived on for many years after the murder, the happy little girl she once was died that fateful morning and has returned to the building. And finally, the killer himself, trapped for eternity at the scene of his own crime, just one of the lost souls inhabiting the Dean house.